Um, hi everyone. Um, so uh, my name's Alice Alice Codner. Um, I've been a part of Christian Climate Action for a couple of years now, and I've met some of you, but not all of you, before. Um, I'm a primary school teacher. Uh, I'm currently working in Gloucest Gloucestershire, focusing on outdoor learning. And before that, um, originally my degree was in theology, so I've been working on trying to find out where the overlaps between environmental education and theology are, um, which is quite a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> So the title for this se session is Wisdom for Living. Um, and there will be a few points uh, where it would be good to have some interaction and some involvement. So um, when we're having some discussion time, I can pause the recording if that would help. Um, and um, if you would like to contribute, maybe we could do the hands up. Uh, Maybe we could do a hands up for contributing, or you can just um, wave at me uh, if you'd like to say something. Um, you don't have to say anything. Um, but if you'd like to, that'd be really nice. So before I start, um, I wondered if we could do a quick word association. Um, when I say the word wisdom, what's the first image or word that comes to mind? If you have a bit of paper in front of you, could you just note down um, what do you think wisdom means? Um, just that, yeah. If you were going to do a one, sent one sentence definition of wisdom, um, what would it be? And I'm not going to ask you to share it. Uh, it's just so that you can compare, um, see if you still agree with your definition at the end of the session. Okay, so um, in the session, we're going to think about what wisdom means to some of the biblical writers um, and think about if that's the same or different to what we might mean by the word wisdom. We're going to think about how that might be relevant to um, the ecological crises today and also how that's relevant to our involvement in activism. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, there we go, that's fine. Um, so this is King Solomon. Um, let's get that out of the way. This is um, King Solomon who, uh, like some of you, that was the first word association that I had um, with the word wisdom. Um, so Solomon's wisdom is renowned for the first pretty much 10 chapters of One Kings um, before he kind of goes off the rails a bit. Um, so I thought I'd have a closer look at wisdom with the question, what actually is it? Um, what was Solomon's wisdom made of and what was meant by wisdom? So I, let's see if I can, come on, uh -huh, there we go. Um, so I started looking for the word wisdom um, in those first chapters of 1 Kings, um, which is the story about Solomon. And I was intrigued to find that in my Bible, um, he was described as being wise in his mind. Um, whereas in other translations, he was wise in his heart. So I looked at the um, Hebrew and found that in all cases, it was this word lev, that means heart, that was used. Um, but because in our Western culture, wisdom is generally seen as something that's located in the brain, um, the translators had changed it to the word mind. Um, but in fact, this word lev is a physical word, first of all. Um, it refers to the organ that pumps blood around the body. And in, pump, in, in so doing, it also generates thought, 
understanding, rationality, emotion, joy, and despair. It's also where desire comes from. And it, from that desire is where the decisions and the choices we make come from. So Solomon is described as wise in his heart. And that does mean he makes good decisions, but it's also more than that. That wisdom is kind of interwoven with his whole being. It's a different understanding of what it means to be human, where the head and the body aren't separate. The mind and the body are one, um, and one isn't more important than the other. The heart, the centre of wisdom, is the centre of all life. Um, we're all one integrated being. Um, and I found that reflected in the way that wisdom was described um, in Solomon. So um, if I, I'm going to just quickly do a kind of skim through um, Solomon's life. And then we're going to look at this one passage in a bit more detail. Um, so I'm going to just stop share for a second. So I'm going to take you on a just a stop tour of um, the first part of Solomon's life. So we first meet Solomon um, when he's a child and he's being made king. He, in my imagination, doesn't really know what's going on at this point. And um, it's all happening to him in a bit of a blur uh, as his father is dying. Um, and the kind of first um, key episode we see is Solomon praying to God, um, saying, essentially, um, I don't really know how I fit in this picture. I don't really know what's going on. Um, please, can I have wisdom? And God says, because you've asked for wisdom, you will have wisdom. You will also have riches um, and honour. Uh, and um, be a kind of well-honoured and king, uh, king that stands out among the nations. Um, then we get this story of the two of the two women with their baby, and the kind of whose baby is it, and the story that I'm sure you're familiar with of what do we do with this baby? And Solomon says, well, let's cut the baby in half. And the one woman says, yeah, that's fine. And the other woman says. Um, no, she can have the baby. And Solomon says, okay, that's the mother. Um, so then we have lots of descriptions about Solomon getting very wealthy. Um, and um, having many, many people under his, uh, under his care. Um, then we have the kind of description of building the temple, Solomon's temple. Um, and we have the visit of... Um, the Queen of Sheba, um, who is kind of amazed by Solomon's wisdom. And again, we have increased wealth um, to a kind of mind blowing uh, scale. So that's the kind of section that we're, going, that we're focusing on. Um, a summary of Sol Solomon's wisdom can be found in 1 Kings 4 29 to 34. And I'm just going to um, put that in the chat um, because 1 Kings 4, 29 to 34. Um, because then I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. Uh, I'll pause the recording um, and okay. um, I'll pause the recording and put you into breakout rooms with the question of um, what did Solomon's wisdom enable him to do? That's the question. So because he was wise, what was it? What did it mean that he could do? Also putting that in the chat. Solomon's wisdom enable him to do. Um, so hopefully somebody in your breakout room uh, will have a Bible available and um, we'll have, let's say five minutes for that. Um, uh, there was, um, he understood about plant life and about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. Um, also, he um, was really good at writing songs. Um, and that was also part of his wisdom. 
um, which I thought was quite fascinating as well. Um, and yeah, and he had influence on the um, countries all around us, all around him. Um, so let's keep going thinking about that. Um, this was um, practical wisdom. Um, so when I told a friend I was doing a session about wisdom, she responded, that sounds very abstract. And I thought that that kind of fits with our, our idea of wisdom as something quite cerebral, but actually um, for most of the Bible passages that mention wisdom, it's, it's something that's actually highly practical. Solomon knows the extent to which that we're dependent on the world around us. Um, he doesn't need to go on a course about getting connected with nature, as if it were even possible to be dis disconnected from nature, because without plants, animals, air and water, we die. So Solomon's wisdom is demonstrated by his understanding of trees, plants and animals to the extent that everyone wants to hear him talking about them. Um, this is practical wisdom that's also reflected in the proverbs that are attributed to him. For example, know well the condition of your flocks, give attentions to your herds, riches do not last forever, nor will a crown last for all generations when the grass is gone, a new growth appears and the herbage of the mountains is gathered and the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of your field. There will be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and nourishment of your servant girls. As Christians, we're often so quick to move towards a metaphorical understanding of these passages. But whatever wisdom is found here, the first meaning is physical and literal. It concerns having enough food to feed everyone in the household, everyone in society, including those of lowest status. It's about paying attention to the world around us so that we can be sustained for generations in a way that money by itself never will. How many governments and big corporations could do with understanding that? While our culture tends to devalue the physical world and those who do physical work, this sees physical work as a demonstration of wisdom. Um, and Solomon isn't the only one to understand wisdom in terms of caring for the land. This is a passage from Isaiah, which provides an image that demonstrates God's wisdom. Um, it's a passage about um, each uh, living thing being treated according to its needs. It's place and crop specific, and it's about practical knowledge. That is wisdom that comes from God. It's about, um, I'll just read a, a bit of it. Um, do those who plow for sowing plow continually? Do they continually open and harrow their ground? When they have leveled its surface, do they not scatter dill, sow cumin, and plant wheat in rows and barley in its proper place and spelt as the border? for they're well instructed, their God teaches them. Um, and down here, dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is cartwheel rolled over cumin, but dill is beaten out with a stick, cumin with a rod. Grain is crushed for bread, but one doesn't thresh it forever, one drives the cartwheel and horses over it, but doesn't pulverize it. This comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Um, so gardening and farming are occupations that require the highest forms of wisdom. They're not to be scoffed at. According to bi biblical wisdom, farmers, especially those who manage to produce food using sustainable practices, are recognised as exemplars of wisdom. Land-based workers who understand the different needs of different species of plants and animals are afforded a high status. Um, secondly, Solomon's wisdom is demonstrated by his creativity. Um, he writes proverbs and he writes songs. Creativity is also wise. Art, drama, music, writing, contain and communicate wisdom. So often we think of wisdom as rational, but Solomon's wisdom is demonstrated by songwriting. Um, and so we see the word wisdom appearing over and over again in the creation of the tabernacle back in Exodus. 
but it's a pity that um, so often that same word wisdom gets translated as skill or craftsmanship. So we lose um, what's being talked about here. So for example, um, this is an example of what gets translated usually as skillful. All the women who were wise hearted spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun of blue and purple and yarns of scarlet and of fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. Wisdom means understanding the different kinds of yarn and the different dyes. It means the creation of fabric. Wisdom means working with your hands as well as your mind. In fact, wisdom doesn't distinguish between them. They're all part of life generating practice. Um, and then as well as what we'd call understanding the natural world and creativity and skill, Solomon's wisdom gets jobs done. Wisdom includes business sense, like the woman of valor at the end of Proverbs, who's described as wise. It includes people management, project management, coordination and practical sense, enough to build a magnificent temple, but to maintain the humility to ask God to dwell there, knowing that there's no guarantee that God will agree. So wisdom includes taking a risk, understanding one's position as small and dependent on God, just as Solomon did when he was a child. And finally, wisdom brings about justice. In the story of the two mothers and the baby, when Solomon suggests cutting the baby in half and finds the mother, the significant point that's described is that Solomon was able to bring about justice. Uh, anybody can be wise. The Hebrew Bible includes all sorts of different people who are wise and need to be paid attention to. Women and men and people from all different walks of life, especially from those groups in society that are often overlooked. Actions that bring about justice are wise. Um, and at this point, I just wanted to take the opportunity to um, remind you or maybe let you know about um, these videos that are up on the CCA YouTube um, channel of the Climate and Colour Conference that was in 2020, so it's two years ago, um, that are well worth a watch or a rewatch. Um, so in this um, session that I've put up on the screen here, um, Radhika Bynon points out that our movement speaks to and connects with white people and middle class people more effectively than it speaks to and connects to people of colour and to working class people. Those are her words. And she questions, how can we frame our movement so that it connects to the priorities of people of, people of colour already have? So one way that she suggests is looking at environmental racism. For example, Currently, in the UK, people of black and mixed multiple ethnicities are over six times as likely as white ethnic groups to live in areas of higher pollution. Four times as likely to have no access to outdoor space at home. Similarly, people of colour are more than twice as likely to live in the most green space deprived areas. And almost half of all incinerators in the UK are in areas with high populations of people of colour. So I just wanted to throw those statistics out to show that, um, to link to justice and injustice. Given these statistics, it's not surprising that the first person to have air pollution listed as a potential cause of their death with was Ella Adukisi Deborah, a black girl from an area of high deprivation. I recommend going back to listen to this talk because it's important that we respond to the challenges that are presented in it, that we don't just let it pass by as a phase, that was 2020, because practical actions which bring about justice are inherently wise. So from what we've looked at with Solomon, we see that wisdom is practical. Wisdom is rooted in earth. Wisdom brings life. 
Wisdom is creative. Wisdom is skillful. Wisdom gets stuff done. Wisdom understands dependence. Wisdom is a trait that can be afforded to everyone. And wisdom brings about justice. So that's the kind of um, that's the kind of input part of this session over. So I thought we'd now have a bit of time to talk in um, breakout groups. Where have you witnessed wisdom of this kind in activism? Um, and what kinds of wisdom would you like to see more of in activist groups? Um, so let's stop the share for a moment. Um, 